exploring how we can master ourselves by looking at how authors and experts say it is possible with your host, Shashiti Basu. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 95 of How to Be with me, Shashiti, as your timid presenter, guiding you through life's tricky topics and skills by reading through the best books out there. Our existence unfolds within an intricately connected global tapestry, yet the choices we make often stem from self-interest. While our innate capacity for empathy exists, studies indicate that it is predominantly directed towards those we perceive as part of our inner circle. This unfortunate reality leaves substantial segments of society overlooked, or worse, adversely affected by our choices. The COVID-19 pandemic has served as a stark reminder of our interdependence. What originated as a virus transferring from an animal to human in a remote corner of the world swiftly evolved into a world pandemic, impacting every individual or nation without exception. The crisis accentuated the delicate balance between our self-interest and the undeniable truth of our interconnectedness. But how can we be more interconnected? Here is Jock Brockus, author of Deadly Departed and editor-in-chief of Paranormal Daily News on his views. What is the self? Well, the self is an identity. It's an identity that you can connect with or that you try to connect with. But the reality is, is that the self is you, is how you exist. It is you becoming self-realized in all that there is. And the reason I say this is because we are not separated from anything that exists. You see, the same animating force that gives life to the flower, that gives life to the child, that gives life to the sun, that gives life to the, the, the clouds that animate the raindrop to fall to the ground to nourish the ground is the same animating force that animates you. The only reason that we see separateness is because we create an illusion. Our names are a label only, but our self is interconnected with everything that exists, that all that exists. That animating force that animates all of life and even the child to cry is the same animating force that gives you life. Therefore, you are the leaf on the tree. You are the raindrop, you are the flower, you are the crying child. That same animating force that gives life to all that exists in the universe is you. And you only exist because of that same animating force. Therefore, to understand what the self is, is to understand your interconnectedness to all that exists in the universe. You are not separate, you're one. Our first book is from the renowned author Daniel J. Siegel, MD, who was a graduate of Harvard Medical School and completed his postgraduate medical education at UCLA with training in paediatrics and child, adolescent and adult psychiatry. He is currently a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine, founding co-director of UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center, founding co-investigator at UCLA Center for Culture, Brain and Development, an executive director of the Mindsight Institute, an educational center devoted to promoting insight, compassion, and empathy in individuals, families, institutions, and communities. Dr. Siegel's psychotherapy practice spans 30 years, and he has published extensively for the professional audience. He serves as the founding editor for the Norton Professional Series on Interpersonal Neurobiology, which includes over 70 textbooks, Dr. Siegel's books include five New York Times bestsellers such as Aware, The Science and Practice of Presence and Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain. He has been invited to lecture for the King of Thailand, Pope John Paul II, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Google University and TEDx. We're talking about his 2022 book, Intraconnected, Mui or Mui, Me Plus We, as the integration of self-identity and belonging. It was such an honour speaking with him. Hence, here is a snippet of our chat. But find the full interview on www.howtobe247.com or on the YouTube channel. You know, the word intraconnection came up 
when I was on a retreat with some system scientists in the mountains where we spent three days by ourselves and uh, in our individual little encampments. And then when we came back and people were saying, what was the experience like? Then my colleagues began around the circle to say they felt interconnected with the forest or they felt interdependent or interwoven or interlaced. And when it came time for me to speak, I really was thinking deeply about what they were saying. I could feel the feeling they were describing, but the prefix inter, I-N-T-E-R, means there's a betweenness between two separate entities. And the experience that I had, and maybe even that they were trying to describe, but the experience that happened when I was in the forest for three days was not that I was connected with the trees, but the feeling was I was the trees. I was the body called Dan and the trees and the clouds and the creek. I was the boulders. I was I were the little squirrels running around. And that was a beautiful feeling. And so I had to try to put words to it. So I said in the group, you know, I can't really say I was interconnected because that implies there was a me here and a forest out there, but rather there was something about being the whole with a bunch of connections within the whole. So what would I call that? And I paused and thought about it. I said, well, I guess I would say I was intra-connected. But then when I came back to, you know, civilization and we had our computers, I tried to type my notes about what the experience was like. And every time I typed in intra-connected, it would autocorrect it to interconnected because there, turns out, was no word intraconnected. So then I realized if we don't have a word to describe the perspective of the whole, then maybe we needed one. And it's important not to create new words. We have plenty of words in the world. But sometimes if there isn't a word that gets at something we really need to have in our world, like acting on behalf of the greater good, acting as if we were not just these separate entities, but the wholeness of life, for example, then it's worth trying out to see if the new word has a value. The word construct is great because it means it's constructed. And in fact, that's exactly what the research shows is that how we determine what this thing self is. And this is where you know the subtitle self-identity belonging is in there. We use certain features to identify what we consider a center of experience or a self, and that determines how we belong. So those three things, self, identity, and belonging, are very interrelated. Because it's a construction, what that means is you can get messages like from your parents or your teachers or your peers or the whole culture that says your self is separate. So in the United States, for example, we have the most individualistic culture in the world. And we have some of the highest rates of mental suffering, depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, suicide. It's really quite sad, even though we have almost more material wealth than any other place on the planet, we have more mental suffering. Now, you think about it, could that be related to the individualism because the self as a constructed entity, if the culture is telling you it's just a separate individual that is what the self means, the individual, then we can understand that that's actually not a very broad way of saying, yes, I do have a body, but I'm also my relationships with family members, relationships with friends, with my community, with my city, with my region, with my country, with all human beings, and then even my relationships with all living beings. So this is like an identity lens you can learn that you do have. So you don't have to get rid of the idea, I'm a me inside the body, but realize I'm also a we in my interconnections with humans and with all living beings. But then you go beyond even the interconnected we to say I'm both a me and a we, I'm interconnected within the wholeness. And that's where the word we comes in where you say, what is a way of even naming who I am? Because if I just go to we, I kind of, I lose my individual inner experience. But if I just stay with me, then I'm separate. So we is a fun word where we say we're an intra-connected identity. Well, you know, one of the ways of thinking about modes 
is that we have energy flowing through the nervous system and for it to be efficient, it needs to learn a pattern of basically how to direct attention, which is what directs energy flow, and then how to filter that energy in ways that basically constructs information that is symbols and, and, and the way we believe things are and the stories we tell, for example. So we do have these two quite distinct modes. They may have their origins on the two different sides of the brain, but there's definitely overlap left and right. So I like to call them modes rather than worrying about the side of the brain. But you can talk about a more narrow focus of what you can simply call the left mode, if you want to put a name to it, versus the broad focus of a right mode. And the right mode is not only broad, but it allows you to see the big picture, the the connections among things within a system, but also see the patterns in the system itself, whereas the more narrow focus of the left mode tends to pick one aspect of the system, a part of the system, and then emphasize the details of that part rather than seeing the big picture that the right mode sees. So the reason in Interconnected I go into detail about these modes, even though they're controversial, is the science is very clear. We do have two modes, even if that uses both sides of the brain for both things, but there's a dominance in the left on one, dominance in the right on the other. So it isn't so much about the side of the brain as the mode of information processing. And that's why it's important because yes, you can look at the part like I'm an individual in this body, you're an individual in your body. But then if we use the other mode, we go, whoa, but you know, there's a wholeness where intraconnection can really be felt, you know, the subjective sense of it, the perspective of the whole, the agency of the whole that spells the acronym SPA, sensation, perspective, and agency, is one way of defining what we mean by self. So you can actually adjust this identity lens by tapping into different modes of information processing. I think there's a a lot of science behind what I'm about to say, but as I'm about to say it, I feel nervous because it seems like a pretty big statement. But if you look at the major challenges we're facing on Earth today, which include, of course, you know, social injustice and racism. It includes the polarization and misinformation we're seeing around the planet. It includes an addiction to screens. It includes loneliness and isolation with all the mental suffering that goes with that. And it also includes the climate crisis. Now, I think even the way we've mishandled COVID-19, that's a sixth pandemic, I think each of these pandemics may actually be related to the modern cultural view of self equals individual. That is this isolated, let's call it the solo self, right? And instead of seeing the self as including the body and our relationships with people on the planet. So the outcome is, I think, all these pandemics. And at a very immediate level, what the good news about identifying this as the possible common source is that we can work at all these levels of dealing with social injustice, dealing with the climate crisis and all the other pandemics, we actually can relatively quickly develop a broader view of what we mean by self and say, whoops, we basically had a mistaken identity. So we put sensation, perspective, and agency, how we can define what the self is, this center of experience, we put it inside the body alone. And the consequences of that are that people are drawn to it because it creates a certain feeling of certainty, which gives us a feeling like maybe we'll be safe because we know who I am is just this body. Because, wow, if you're saying I'm all the relationships with my friends and family, and I am actually all my relationships with humanity and, oh my gosh, I'm all of living beings, you don't have much certainty with that. So it's this longing for certainty that makes the modern message of the self is only the individual, this individual view, very appealing and then almost addicting. 
because then when you start feeling something's not quite right, if the message is, well, then get more stuff, then you start distracting yourself with stuff rather than enriching your life with connection. And I think that's what's basically depleting all the resources on earth. And that's keeping us sort of blind to the way we need to go, which is you know, part of my deepest hope for the book, Intra Connected, is if we can just identify this common cause of all these serious problems in, on earth, then we have a chance to actually take a deep breath and go, okay, let's get in this together and work as a we, where we don't get rid of the me, but we embrace the true identity as me and we, this interconnected whole. And I think humanity can do it. I really think we can because of this constructed quality of the self. The biggest issue is will we? In the book, Interconnected, Professor Siegel invites readers on a journey to explore the concept of self, identity and belonging in the modern world. He emphasizes that our sense of self is not solely rooted in our individual bodies, but is shaped by our relationships with others and our connection to nature. The author draws from various scientific approaches and philosophical perspectives to delve into the nature of the self. The concept of Mawi is introduced as a way to symbolize the integration of the individual self, me, with the collective self, we, within an interconnected whole, Mawi. During a transformative field trip in the Colorado Rockies, he experienced a profound shift in his sense of self. The author describes a moment of unity with nature and a dissolution of their separate identity. This experience challenged the conventional notion of self and led to the creation of the term intraconnected to describe a sense of interconnectedness within a larger whole. However, he acknowledges the limitations of a purely reductionist Western scientific view of the self and suggests that there are other ways of knowing and understanding reality such as indigenous science and contemplative insights. These different perspectives offer valuable insights into the interconnectedness of life. The concept of identity and belonging is explored in the context of self and interconnectedness. The book questions what defines the self, whether it's just the individual or a broader interconnected system. Drawing parallels between biological systems and societal constructs, it highlights the dangers of excessive differentiation, comparing it to autoimmune disorders or cancer in living organisms. He emphasizes the importance of recognizing our interconnectedness with other humans and nature, promoting a wider sense of belonging. He also discusses the evolution of identity throughout history from matter to living beings and encourages adjusting one's identity lens to embrace a broader perspective, ultimately empowering individuals to connect with the entire interconnected system of reality. From the prenatal experience of being in the womb to postnatal life, we see the focus on the development of the self-identity and belonging form. The shift is from a state of simply being in the womb, where all needs are met effortlessly, to the postnatal world where the body must take action to survive, such as breathing, eating and forming connections. Systems thinking is therefore vital in understanding the interconnectedness of the self with the environment and the significance of implicit memory in shaping our experiences and longing for wholeness. Hence, there is a complex interplay between our physical bodies, our inner selves, and our relationships with the world around us as we navigate the journey of life. Infancy marks the start of our dependency on caregivers, a period lasting longer in humans compared to other mammals. Our brain development combined genetic factors and experiences with energy flowing through neural networks, creating neural representations. Sensation and perception both influenced by prior learning, shape our experiences and beliefs. We integrate external and internal energy streams through senses and body awareness. The brain's complexity consists of the cortex for perception and thought, the limbic area for assessing meaning and emotion, and the brain stem for basic bodily functions and threat responses. In the early days of life, subcortical networks drive our inner experiences and actions, these systems motivate us to connect, protect, and correct, manifesting as feelings of sadness or grief, fear, and anger. 
They play a significant role in shaping our emotional life and interacting with our cortex to construct our experiences. In childhood, these systems lead to a drive for connection, protection and correction with varying emotional intensities. Throughout life, these mechanisms continue to shape our sense of self, attention and interpersonal behaviours. Relationships, emotions and meanings are interwoven, influencing neural connectivity and self-development. Integrative flow of energy and information leads to well-being and a resilient self, encompassing both inner and relational facets of identity. The core self involves effectivity, agency, continuity and coherence, influenced by attachment experiences. The relational self encompasses inner and inter aspects of self, shaped by subjective experience, perspective and agency. Both selves continually evolve across the lifespan through the flow of energy and information. Toddlerhood is a crucial period when our brains develop vital skills for self-regulation and interpersonal connections. Our right hemisphere plays a dominant role during this time, fostering broad attention, non-verbal communication and inner soothing. The left hemisphere gradually becomes more active, supporting language and logical thinking. Both sides contribute to our complex mental experiences. Our narrative self, influenced by early interactions, shapes our sense of self and identity. It's formed through the categorization of experiences into mental models and linguistic symbols, affecting how we perceive the world. This narrative self can either emphasize separation or encourage integration, openness, curiosity, kindness and connection, influencing our well-being. Hence, balancing certainty and uncertainty in our narratives is a lifelong challenge, with language both limiting and liberating us. Ultimately, we can strive for a more holistic, integrative narrative of self that includes both noun-like and verb-like aspects of existence. Our experiences are shaped by energy flow, as mentioned before, within our bodies and interactions with our environment. He discusses the development of mental models and schemas as we learn and grow emphasizing that learning involves organizing and shaping information. The 3P framework is introduced, highlighting the interplay between plateaus, peaks and the plane of possibility, illustrating how filters influence our perception of reality and self-identity. The concept of the beginner's mind and the importance of embracing uncertainty are also touched upon. He explores how these states are influenced by factors like attachment relationships, trust and cultural influences. He emphasizes the importance of coherence and security in shaping our individual and collective identities, suggesting that fostering secure and authentic connections can lead to a more interconnected and harmonious world. During school years, Professor Siegel discusses the importance of integrative learning and cultivating natural systems intelligence to foster creativity, curiosity and collaboration. He also talks about the need to shift from a mindset of separateness and comparison to one of connection and collaboration to address contemporary challenges and promote a sense of belonging in a wider community. Narratives help us make sense of our experiences and how mirror neurons enable us to resonate with others' actions and emotions. I can definitely relate to this. I have very strong mirror neurons, which makes me cry on command if I see someone else cry. He suggests that awareness can expand our sense of identity beyond narrow boundaries, promoting greater interconnectedness and well-being. It encourages a shift from a fixed, individualistic view of self to a more fluid, integrative one. Adolescence is a crucial stage of brain development, marked by the growth of emotional spark, social engagement, novelty-seeking and creative exploration, which spells out essence. During this period, teens focus on identity, belonging, and questioning societal norms. Their brains are wired to prepare for independence, adapt to peer relationships, and explore the world. Gender, race, and sexual orientation play significant roles in shaping identity and belonging. Integration of these facets helps individuals thrive. Society should embrace diversity and interconnectedness promoting harmony and health while challenging the myth of the solo self. Next is leaving home, which can be seen as a metaphor for personal and societal transformation. It suggests that just as individuals leave their familiar homes to explore the world and learn new skills, 
Humanity as a whole needs to move beyond its current way of life, BAU, which is business as usual, and adapt to contemporary challenges. To do this, Professor Siegel introduces the idea of a mind-sight lens, which involves stabilising one's perception through openness, objectivity and observation. This lens allows individuals and societies to address vulnerabilities, overcome shame and navigate the complexities of the modern world. He also explores the importance of grief as a catalyst for growth and emphasises the need for practices that promote integrative thinking and well-being. The self is both a noun and a verb, which emphasises the importance of letting go of cognitive boundaries to understand our identity. It draws parallels between the self and energy, highlighting the interconnection of all things. He also discusses the significance of diversity in complex systems and the role of integration in creating harmony. It suggests that our drive for certainty and exceptionalism can hinder our connection with nature and impede our understanding of our place in the world. The concept of systems intelligence emphasises the importance of embracing diversity and integration for optimal self-organisation. Letting go of the need for certainty and control in the face of uncertainty is essential for achieving harmony in modern human lives. Or, as a state of expanded consciousness, can help transcend the limitations of the solar self, fostering kindness and interconnectedness. Or was a book written by Dasha Keltner, who I've actually written a review about on the website, so check it out. Denial and addiction to control contribute to disconnection and suffering in today's world. To move forward, we must embrace uncertainty, courage, creativity and collaboration. The G.O.D. concept represents the generator of diversity and the source of all possibilities. The 3P framework suggests that the mind shapes the experience of energy flow rather than creating the energy itself impacting our perception of self and identity. This perspective offers a path towards positive change in the world. The book also highlights the challenges faced by modern society, including social injustices, environmental destruction, misinformation and attention addiction. It argues that these challenges are rooted in a narrow, individualistic view of the self, which the author refers to as the solo self. This perspective leads to disconnection and suffering, both internally and in our relationships with others and the environment. He proposes that by expanding our understanding of the self to include a broader sense of interconnectedness, we can address these challenges and promote well-being on a personal, societal and planetary level. He also emphasises the importance of integrating the narrow, analytical perspective with a broader systems-oriented view to create a more balanced and holistic understanding of reality. The book also explores the concept that the sense of self can be both a construct and an inherent aspect of the human experience. It suggests that cultural influences such as individualistic and collectivistic perspectives shape how we perceive ourselves. He argues that the modern emphasis on the solo self as a separate entity is a delusion, leading to disconnection and delusion in our lives and societies. He then invites readers to consider the possibility of a more interconnected and fluid sense of self one that aligns with the interconnected nature of the world. He advocates for a shift away from the noun-like fixed identity and toward a more verb-like, dynamic sense of self that emerges from our relationships and interactions with the world. The explorations of self and identity invites us to consider not just what we know, but how we come to know. Professor Segal, on a journey of self-discovery, began with a Western cultural perspective that emphasised a separate individual identity, his background in Western science, particularly biology and molecular mechanisms, reinforced this view. However, his scientific curiosity also led him to appreciate the value of questioning and challenging the assumptions a concept echoed in Adam Grant's book Think Again. The author emphasises the importance of acknowledging indigenous and contemplative ways of knowing. These traditions offer a holistic perspective that considers the interconnectedness of all life. While Western science is one way to understand reality, it should not overshadow the insights gained from contemplative practices and indigenous knowledge, which often emphasise the wisdom, sacredness and a view of the whole. Professor Sigal utilises the concepts of consilience, 
to weave together insights from Western science, indigenous knowledge, and contemplative practices. These diverse perspectives create a cross-disciplinary framework that underlies the concept of interpersonal neurobiology. Throughout the journey, readers are encouraged to pause, reflect, and challenge their own beliefs and assumptions. The goal is to embrace a system's perspective that recognises the interconnectedness of all things and fosters a sense of unity and belonging. This perspective aligns with the wisdom traditions found in various cultures across the globe. The indigenous teachings from different parts of the world highlight the importance of respect, interdependence and harmony with nature. They stress the need to melt the ice in one's heart, embrace unity and value all forms of life. These teachings emphasise that when individuals come together with respect and compassion, they can transform the world. He explores the concept of Ubuntu, a philosophy deeply rooted in African culture, which we'll look into in the next book, and its potential application in modern society. Scholar James Agudu's perspective is also highlighted in the book, emphasising Ubuntu as a relational form of personhood, where one's identity and humanity are nurtured through connections with others. Agude also acknowledges the importance of individual voices and differentiation within the context of Ubuntu, stressing that debates and disagreements are essential for building consensus and addressing community issues. Professor Seagull then draws parallels between Ubuntu and the idea of Mui, an integrated identity that balances individuality and collective belonging. It suggests that modern cultures often lean towards extreme individualism, which then isolates people, and he emphasises the importance of discovering the wisdom of indigenous teachings and integrating them in contemporary life. He features anecdotes illustrating the importance of recognising and honouring individual experiences and histories before striving for collective unity. It emphasises the need for integrating human connections with a broader sense of belonging that extends to all of nature. The reflections on the wisdom of indigenous cultures worldwide, such as the Hawaiian concept of aloha, which is unconditional love, and ho'oponopono, making wrongs right, or along with Ubuntu and Mawi, highlight the potential for humanity to shift towards a more interconnected, compassionate and harmonious way of living, both within ourselves and in our relationship with the natural world. He also acknowledges the influence of Buddhism and other contemplative traditions on his thinking. The book encourages readers to consider how they can contribute to such a world based on love, ethics and care for all. He discusses the prevalence of individualism and disconnection in modern cultures, particularly in the United States, highlighting how this emphasis on separation over interdependence contributes to various societal issues, including social injustice and environmental problems. Seagull suggests that embracing uncertainty and recognising the verb-like, ever-changing nature of the self can lead to a deeper understanding of identity and belonging. Finally, by shifting from a perspective of scarcity to one of abundance and mutual belonging, we can work towards a harmonious and compassionate global community. Seagull's journey underscores the significance of integration, both within ourselves and within the world around us. He invites us to consider how we can bridge the gap between the me and the we, finding a sense of self, identity and belonging that encompasses both individuality and interconnectedness. He invites readers to explore the evolution of self and identity across the lifespan, blending intellectual knowledge, which is noesis, with direct experiential knowledge, gnosis. He encourages readers to embrace a more open, interconnected view of the self challenging the notion of a rigid, separate self in favour of a more fluid and integrated identity. Our final book is from Mungi Ngomane, who is a passionate advocate for human rights with a particular focus on girls and women and the protection of refugees. She has worked on initiatives addressing Islamophobia in the United States, conflict resolution in the Middle East, and the liberation of the Palestinian people. Granddaughter of renowned Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Ngomane has taken up the family mantle to campaign for justice and human dignity. We're looking at her book, Everyday Ubuntu, which explains the 14 practices of Ubuntu, a South African philosophy which teaches that all humans are deeply interconnected. Here she is speaking to CTV or Morning. So I was introduced to it as I was growing up by my mother and my grandparents and sort of how my grandfather fought for strangers the same way he would for family and friends. Um, But it's 
the easiest way to say it's a way of life that recognizes that we're all of infinite worth and value. And if we sort of start from that assumption, then life may be easier and better for everyone. We couldn't think of a number. And at first we thought maybe 27 years to symbolize Nelson Mandela's time in prison. But then we decided 27 with two watered down and 14 really symbolized how important the Constitution was to ending apartheid in South Africa and how much work went into, you know, not going for revenge and retribution, but rather centering Ubuntu and the new nation. So strength, size, and unity is about, you know, the strength of the group is so much more than an individual. And so you think of the Me Too movement and the Bring Back Our Girls campaign and considering that yesterday was MLK Day, even just the the March on Washington and how these movements had such an impact on where we are today. I mean, I think humor humanizes all of us. It brings us together. And, you know, there are examples of my grandfather speaking at funerals and in tough situations where he just made a joke and it sort of brings everyone in the room together. And humor is just a a quick reprieve to where you can sort of, you know, collect yourself and then return to what you need to do. I don't think it's counter. I do think that it focuses more on all of us instead of the self and selfies and social media. But I think there's a way to bring it into the Western world. Obviously, it's huge on the African continent, just in different words. Um, But I don't think it's necessarily counter. I think it's an it's an everyday thing. One day could be a good day. One day could be a bad day. But it's just about recognizing the worth of other human beings. And if you start with yourself, I think it's easier to show this outward dignity and respect to everyone else. In today's digital age, technology offers both connection and isolation. While it connects us globally, it also fosters self-centered digital personas seeking validation through likes and shares. This has led to increased loneliness despite a vast online audience. The concept of Ubuntu, a South African philosophy, emphasizes human interconnectedness and respect for others. By recognizing the inherent value in everyone, we shift from competition to appreciation. Instead of comparing ourselves to others, we focus on their contributions to our lives, fostering a sense of belonging. Simple actions like making eye contact can help establish meaningful connections with strangers, reinforcing this sense of interconnectedness. To truly connect with others, it's crucial to empathize with their perspectives, even if we profoundly disagree. Ubuntu encourages understanding others' positions as demonstrated by a black woman in apartheid-era Johannesburg. Rather than automatically despising white communities, she contemplated the circumstances that led to their actions. This reflection revealed that most individuals accept circumstances favoring them, leading to a shift from judgment to curiosity about why someone might act hurtfully. This approach humanizes people, helping us comprehend their motivations and circumstances. By occupying another's perspective, we realize their actions are often a product of their own context, promoting empathy and tranquility in our interactions. Respect is the cornerstone of Ubuntu, emphasizing that respecting others reconnects us with our own humanity. This lesson is illustrated through the story of Archbishop Desmond Tutu's childhood encounter with a respectful white priest. Recognizing the value of Tutu's mother, the priest not only honored her humanity, but also his own. Practicing Ubuntu begins with self-care to have the energy to help others. It involves treating everyone with respect, regardless of their background, as exemplified by Nelson Mandela's transformative friendship with his prison guard. Language plays a crucial role. Dignified and open-minded communication fosters connections and changes perspectives, promoting a better future. Another aspect is hope. Hope is more than a fleeting desire for things to go well. It's a state of being that helps us endure challenges. Unlike optimism, which is contingent on positive outcomes, hope is steadfast and can be chosen regardless of circumstances. Living with hope means having faith in oneself, the goodness of others and the world. It provides resilience during tough times. Research shows that maintaining hope can help individuals overcome adversity and build better futures. To cultivate hope, counter negative thoughts with positivity, maintain a gratitude journal, and prioritize self-care for a more positive outlook on life. Another part of Ubuntu is forgiving others, which starts with recognizing their humanity. 
even in the face of deep hurt. Ubuntu encourages us to consider the circumstances that may have influenced a person's actions and to empathise with their complexity. Ingrid von Stein's experience exemplifies this approach when, after a violent attack, she eventually found compassion for her attackers by understanding their difficult backgrounds. Forgiveness is a healing power that ultimately benefits the forgiver, offering emotional relief and connection with others. It's important to acknowledge that forgiveness is a journey, requiring patience and persistence, but it leads to a lighter, less burdened heart. Diversity is a valuable asset that we should welcome rather than fear. Each person is unique, contributing their individual talents and perspectives to the world. Embracing diversity aligns with the Ubuntu philosophy, emphasising our shared human journey. If everyone were identical, our collective weaknesses and limitations would be magnified. Recognising every individual's equal worth requires humility and openness to learn from others. Embracing diversity leads to better outcomes and enriched lives. The Tunisian Dialogue Quartet, composed of members from diverse organisations, exemplifies how unity and diversity can achieve peace. We should appreciate the benefits diversity brings to our lives and challenge any unfounded judgments. To make progress, we must confront our current situation honestly. Ubuntu encourages embracing all aspects of life, including the good and the bad, without judgment. Facing reality can be challenging, but it's necessary for healing and growth. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa exemplifies this principle addressing the injustices of apartheid. When the TRC uncovered disturbing facts about victims' bodies being fed to crocodiles, Archbishop Tutu publicly expressed sorrow, fostering empathy and communal support. Humans are wired for empathy, and sharing our pain with others deepens our relationships and eases suffering. Confronting difficulties openly allows us to seek help and connect with others. And finally, deep listening is a powerful act of respect that demonstrates the value of someone's voice, fostering empathy and open-mindedness. True listening requires focused attention, eye contact, open body language and asking questions for clarification. It challenges our inclination to prioritise our own views. Ubuntu encourages listening even when we believe a conversation is irrelevant, as it strengthens empathy and connections. Every individual's story holds value, and attentive listening reinforces their worth. Services like the Samaritan's Hotline provide safe spaces for people to be heard without discrimination. Actively listening allows us to understand differing perspectives and create positive change. So to sum up, Professor Siegel says in Interconnected that reality is interconnected, emphasising the importance of understanding the self's construction and its role in cultural evolution. He discusses the journey from potentiality to actuality, the emergence of complex systems, and the significance of integration and harmony in one's life. He also explores attachment experiences and their impact on identity and belonging, emphasising the potential for growth and transformation. Ultimately, he encourages embracing an interconnected self and widening the lens of identity to enhance personal and planetary well-being through harmonious living. In Everyday Ubuntu, Engomani says modern technology facilitates connections worldwide, but they often lack genuine respect. Ubuntu teaches that all humans are equally valuable, fostering a shift in behaviour. Embracing this belief, we honour everyone we meet regardless of their role. Even strangers deserve respect and empathy, creating a sense of belonging. She recommends use humour to connect with others as laughter brings relief in tough times and strengthens bonds. Share embarrassing stories with a friend who has an infectious laugh to transform embarrassment into humour and strengthen your connection. I'm a big believer in Ubuntu. I don't believe that there's only ourselves. I believe there's a greater world where we are a part of and we need to do our job. This also includes the climate change disaster. We have to all be together to actually make a difference. What do you think? Do you believe in interconnection and a greater self? Let us know. Please join in on the conversation by following at HowToBe247 on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and subscribe on the podcast which can be found via www.howtobe247.com. We have Spotify polls so feel free to send your responses there too. 
You can even check out all our exclusive Unseen bonus material from every single interview, all for a price of a coffee on both Spotify and Patreon, under the name Behind the Scenes Exclusives from the How to Be Books podcast. All the latest ones are on Spotify, while more than 30 exclusives are on Patreon. Sign up to be part of the movement. Please do leave a review if you found this helpful and want to be featured. And remember to check out the website. We've got a number of reviews, including Millie Bobby Brown's new book, 19 Steps, but even more intriguing is Naomi Klein's new book, Doppelganger, which looks into her being mistaken for Naomi Wolf, thought to be the conspiracy theorist. Before we go, here are Emma Starr's creative director at Kenman Media Relations in the UK, and Julia Owen Nuttall, a fertility well-being practitioner and the co-founder of the Non-Invasive Method on Their Thoughts. See you next week. What do I think the self is? It depends who we're trying to prove that to. The self we show to others through our fashion choices, the beliefs we have, the way we talk, the way we look, even recording selfies of ourselves and posting them on social media. But are they really ourselves? I don't think so. I think it's a presentation of ourselves, but our true essence is deeper than that. It's not even physical, in my opinion. It's energy. It's on an energetic level, um, an atomic level, which is shown in our biology, uh, which has taken millions and millions of years through biology uh, and evolution to appear. But I believe we're a spiritual being and that that persists. You know, we're the creation of stars, in my opinion. Uh, It's not just because of my name. Uh, I think we are connected to nature through that. But something bigger than that as well, the universe and all the thought systems and beliefs that have gone that, you know, gone before us, they are too energy. So to keep sight of that, I do think we need to get beyond the physical and we need to take stock of our thoughts, the things we say, how we move, the activities we pursue, because to me that's all energy and vibration and to keep that positive, that reflects who you are, that shows in your personality. What is the self? Well, the self is our higher self, our soul connection, what connects us with the universe What can get in the way of that is the ego, the shadow side, the inner child. And that can sometimes get in the way of us understanding the connection to the universe, the larger part of ourselves. And when we understand that we are energy and that energy is around us and, you know, trees and other species are all energy, that's when we understand that we are all in this universe together. And being in this universe together, we are energy. And there's no distinct disconnection between that energy. 